This weekend, I got to play the Diablo 4 beta. I did not pre-order the game, and I did not order a KFC sandwich. I was granted access to this beta by filling out a form that Mikey Barr tweeted out specifically for content creators. And as you can imagine, as someone who has been reporting on the fall of the Diablo franchise pretty much ever since they announced Diablo Immortal all the way back in 2018, I'm sure everybody remembers when a redshirt guy addressed the stage and basically asked what we all, were all thinking. Is this an out-of-season April Fool's joke? That was definitely how I felt. I did a lot of coverage when it came to the mishandling of um, the Diablo franchise by Blizzard. I've been outstandingly disappointed. To give you guys some context, uh, Diablo 1 might have been one of the first RPGs that I've ever played. Diablo 2 was potentially my most played game throughout my teen years. I love that game and consider it to be my favorite game of all time, all the way up until I played uh, Dark Souls, which is a lot because I played a lot of games since then, and Diablo 2 was always the one that I was like, man, this this game is so friggin' good, right? I also played Diablo 3. I did not like base Diablo 3 very much because through the implementation of the Real Money Auction House, Blizzard nerfed loot drops to a ridiculous extent to the point where I was basically just grinding gold and buying stuff off of the auction house to be able to actually progress in the game, and that got old real fast. Uh, Reaper of Souls was a big improvement, so that was cool. It was a shame that they didn't build upon that because there were there was another expansion planned for Diablo 3. I think that would have been interesting. There were also multiple Diablo projects that were canceled, such as I believe the name was Project Fenrir, which was going to be you know, a, a Dark Souls version of Diablo almost, which would have been something interesting to check out. All of that stuff got canceled. And eventually I even played the entirety of Diablo Immortal just to make sure that I was 100% correct when I stated that this game was going to be a piece of shit. 30 hours or 40 hours or however much long it took me to play all of the content that was available at launch. And I was able to state with great confidence, yes indeed, I was correct. This game is a piece of shit. And it's not, it's not just because of the monetization either, because even if you remove the monetization, the result is still a piece of trash. You saw that little nuance there? Yeah, I stopped saying the, the really bad word because at a certain point, YouTube is going to come in and is going to be like, hey, that, that's, that's too many uses of the S word. But anyway, um, you know, so with all of this background, naturally, I have been following a little bit of the information that they uh, have been releasing about Diablo 4, and my thought process was, I don't think that this is going to be it. I hate the business model that they are going for in this game with, like, the whole season pass, FOMO, uh, premium track for season pass with accelerated tiers. Hell, the price alone, like I think the the, the business model of, of Diablo 4 as a whole, I think is completely disgusting. I think it's a terrible business model. Particularly one of the things that I think is the most egregious isn't even the battle pass. It is the fact that they are selling you four days early access for about $20. Probably more depending on which region that you live in. But yeah, I think that that is pretty disgusting. But that's just my opinion. Feel free to agree or disagree. It doesn't really matter. I'm going to be talking mostly about gameplay in this video. And uh, let me just explain something to you. I went into this beta and my thought process as I went into the beta was... This is going to confirm uh, what I believe about Diablo 4, that this is not going to be a game for me, and therefore, once I play this beta, I can get it out of my system, and I won't even have to worry about it anymore. No joke, that is exactly how I went into the beta. I was just like, okay, let me just play this, let me see how bad it is, and then never touch it again. And what happened was the exact opposite. The beta, turns out, is actually pretty good. They did a really good job with this beta. To give you an idea, I've, like I said, I'm coming up on about 30 hours of gameplay that I've played on this beta. And in those 30 hours, I was not able to achieve, you know, completing the entirety of the beta. Now, if I had played just one character, I would have been able to complete all of the activities of the beta. But it would have taken me a long time because I remember it took me about like 15 hours or so to be done with my barbarian. Maybe a little bit less than 15 hours. And in those 15 hours, I never really repeated content, as in I was constantly doing like a different dungeon or fighting a different world event or doing campaign missions or doing different side quests. 
I never really had to repeat content. So the beta had a lot of content. By the way, this beta is going to be public next week for everyone. So one of the things that I would say is that if you're even mildly interested in Diablo 4, you should definitely check out next weekend's beta because anyone can play it on pretty much any platform, right? So now that we know this, let's take things by steps. First, uh, as per usual, everybody's going to be wanting to hear about visuals and animations. And this is actually a very interesting thing because from the gameplay footage that I had watched in videos and stuff on YouTube, it wasn't very appealing to me. I couldn't quite put my finger on it, but I was like, there's just something about this look. I get it. They're going for a more realistic look, a more subtle look, when if you compare it with something like, say, Path of Exile or a Diablo 3, where just like constant explosions, mobs blowing up all over the screen, and you can barely tell what the hell is happening throughout all of the layers of special effects that are popping off at any given second. Whereas Diablo 4 goes for a much more subtle vibe. You know, I think that is actually a good thing now that I've gotten to experience it, but it doesn't necessarily translate very well to videos, particularly when you start putting them side by side with Diablo 3 or Path of Exile or any of these other games. It almost looks worse, but the reality, then this is what I can tell you, and this is something that you'll be able to check for yourself next weekend, which is why, you know, it's important to get this video out now so that people are aware, hey, if you want to check this out for yourself, you should, you can, without paying a single dime. Um, but the reality was that the feel that you get from actually playing the game is very different than the vibe that you get from watching the videos on YouTube. I feel like the videos on YouTube, even live streams, stuff like that, don't really do the game justice because there is, it's just different when you're actually playing it. There's no other way to say it. Now, there are certain things that definitely don't translate due to, don't translate the video due to YouTube's encoders and stuff like that. There's a, a lot of like foggy areas in the game, which basically just makes videos look like whitewashed and stuff like that. And that, they could have done a better job of balancing that out in the game itself. I understand the kind of like ambience that they're going for, but um, I feel like it can be potentially a little bit more fine-tuned, uh, but whatever. Overall, visuals and animation, I thought, were actually pretty good. I don't really have a whole lot of complaints. One of the things that I can tell you is that the combat has, with, with the Barbarian at least, which is the one that I spent the most time playing, but even with the other classes, I felt like the impact is pretty good. The impact of the, the hits, the, the visual feedback that you get uh, from you know pressing a button, seeing what is happening on screen, seeing a mob blow up, all of these different things. These are always things that I feel that Diablo does better than a lot of its competition. And I understand that, you know, for you, you know, different people are going to like different things. But for me, Diablo was always very, very special. Uh, I really like the world of Sanctuary. I like the lore around Sanctuary. It is very easy for all of us to say, though, that the story of Diablo 3 was terrible. I did not like that whatsoever. Uh, I think that the story of Diablo 1 was pretty good. The story of Diablo 2 is pretty good as well. I know that there are some people that don't like the story of Diablo 2. I personally like it. Story of Diablo 3, however, it almost seemed like the people who made Diablo 3 never even played Diablo 2, considering some of the uh, some of the freedoms that they took within the storytelling of that game was kind of weird, such as, oh, we'll just let this soul stone fall off the, the edge after you defeat this boss. And I was like, what do you mean? That's insane. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. And that's not even some of the worst stuff. I mean, I'm sure that a lot of people are going to have a lot of things to say when it comes to the Diablo 4 story. But when it comes to the story that I experienced in Diablo 4, in this beta, I was actually impressed. And I wasn't even, you know, it wasn't even something that crossed my mind after what they did in Diablo 3. I'm like, oh, it's, could they possibly do? Like, who gives a crap? But no, it actually feels like it is well thought out. The cutscene moments that you get throughout the, the you know, the, the campaign sections that you have in this beta are actually really good. Um, some people might be quick to point out, oh, well, the cutscenes are in-game and they're, you know, they're not the usual level that people expect from, like, a traditional Blizzard pre-rendered cinematic. But I'm like, yeah, but the in-game cutscenes show our character. It's way cooler, as far as I'm concerned. It's like, I'm, I don't need, like, a 
super giga mega cutscene if the cutscene is well th thought out and translates like and, and showcases an interesting moment in the story. And I'll talk more about uh, the story at the end of this video because I don't want, you know, I know that there's some people who are not going to want to deal with spoilers and stuff like that. But overall, the story I felt was really, really well portrayed and very, very good. And again, this is something that I did not expect. I did not expect the story to grab me the way that it did. Which again, like I said, I'll talk more about the story at the end of the video for those of you that are curious about what I'm talking about. But it was, it was good stuff. The voice acting was excellent as far as I'm concerned all around. It was really cool. Uh, it was interesting because I even had like a discussion in my stream where someone was bringing out, ooh, the voice story, is, the voice acting is so lazy because everybody has the same accent. I'm like, yeah, it makes sense. This is like one region. And in this region, everybody has the same accent, which it was interesting because at, in a certain dungeon, I ran into a, a group of characters where I did like a sub quest inside that dungeon or whatever. And these characters had like uh, an Irish or maybe Scottish accent. Sorry, I'm terrible at distinguishing between those two. I'm pretty sure it was Irish, though. And it, it was very easy to tell that, like, oh, these characters must be from a different region within the world. And, you know, it, it's just a lot of world building with that. And I don't know. It just felt super solid there as well. Uh, the sound overall, really good. I like the soundtrack as well. Uh, you know, it, it doesn't sound as good as the soundtrack from Diablo 2 to me, but I think that a big portion of that is probably nostalgia as well. Uh, but I think that the soundtrack is also really good for this from um, what I've experienced overall. So visuals, sound, story, all really, really good. The, the campaign was enjoyable. Um, and here's another interesting thing, these side quests. There were a lot of side quests that kept popping up as I was advancing through the campaign. I didn't even do all of the side quests that were present in the, in, in the beta, but I did a lot of them. And I thought that the side quests were actually really well done as well from a story perspective. Like, to give you guys a, a bit of an example here, there was a side quest where uh, you perform an exorcism, where you help, uh, you know, you help this religious figure perform an, ex an exorcism. And that kind of advances and ha it has its own little mini storyline, which is completely not related to the main story. But you get to experience uh, this this side story that is evolving it's not it doesn't take place over one quest it's a chain of quests that you do and it's almost like oh, i'll do a little bit of the campaign then i'll do a little bit of this uh chain quest and it was an enjoyable quest all quest line all around there was another quest which was the woodman's axe that one was also enjoyable there are several side quests that you do that also, it, it basically seems like some thought was put into this. It wasn't just like, oh, here's a side quest. Go kill 10 things, come back, boom, side quest complete. It wasn't like that. There was more thought process to it. And again, this all depends on how much effort was placed into this specific act because the beta takes place in act one. And it all depends on how much effort was put into this act versus how much effort will be placed on the remaining acts of the game. But suffice it to say, if this is an accurate representation of what we can expect in the follow-up acts of Diablo 4, it's really impressive. They did a really good job. And again, I was very thorough. I was doing a ton of dungeons. I was doing a ton of side quests, doing all of these things to experience all the different breadth of content. And it just felt like a really fun game to play. Again, much to my surprise. Because I wasn't expecting that. I was expecting the exact opposite. So now let's talk a little bit more about the gameplay. The gameplay felt solid. One of the things that I would like to point out, I played the game on the PlayStation 5. I know that I, I figured most people are going to be playing on the PC, so it would be interesting to have an opinion of someone who's been playing on console. I played everything on, on PlayStation 5. It's also a convenience thing for me. But... Um, a lot of people, this is an interesting thing about the Diablo community because uh, most people choose to play Diablo with mouse and keyboard. I also did back in the day, naturally, because that was the only option. However, when Diablo 3 eventually launched in consoles, I found that I pre much preferred playing it on a controller. I'm not saying that it is better, that is worse. For me, it's better. For my personal taste, it felt better to play it on a controller. As a matter of, as a matter of fact, I, you know, once I played Diablo 3 on a controller, I was like... I never want to play this with mouse and keyboard ever again. 
because it just felt that good. It's very responsive. It's very, you know, it's very intuitive, very natural. There is something that you can kind of point towards controller, and that is if your character has like some very specific targeting abilities, like I was actually testing out today, I was playing a uh, firewall sorceress. And if you, you know, if you try placing firewalls down, it's not as easy with a controller as it is with, uh, you know, mouse and keyboard because you can really, oh, I'll just plop the wall here, boom. With a controller, it kind of like targets a monster and plops the wall on top of that monster, which might not be exactly the best position for that wall. But overall, it's still very much playable and it is not a problem. And for most of the other skills, it's not a problem at all. It's just like very specifically targeted skills that you want to play in very specific spots. In there, I can see mouse and keyboard having an advantage. That and like inventory management, but inventory management is always going to be better with mouse and keyboard. There's just no ifs, ands, or buts about it. But that's not to say that you're going to be like, oh my God, what buttons should I press to manage my inventory? No, it's it's pretty intuitive. And it's the same thing for the, the firewall situation. It's a very specific thing. But overall, I, I still much prefer playing with a controller. I find the experience more enjoyable that way. But to each their own, you know? But anyways, in terms of the gameplay, how does it feel? It feels like they tried slowing down the pace, which is something that I like. I believe I've seen an interview where the developers specifically point out that this is one of the intended things that they want for Diablo 4. They want it to feel more deliberate and maybe less spammy, even though on some classes it was definitely more spammy. Like, for instance, when I was playing my barbarian i felt like i was being much more aware okay i'm using this ability here now i'm using that ability here now when i was playing my rogue i was like yeah i'm gonna throw knives and then florian throw knives and florian mash 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 it was like vroom, vroom, vroom. <laughs> just like throwing stuff super fast like it was way faster uh with the sorceress it was maybe a little bit more deliberate as well but yeah there's definitely some some room there but Basically, I do appreciate the fact that they're going a little bit slower because if you look at like a, a video from someone who is end game map farming in Path of Exile, for instance, I'm not criticizing that. I think that there is a crowd that is going to love that type of playstyle, but it's basically like, let's say it's, it's a character that's zipping through a map at breakneck speed. You can barely see the character itself and everything around that character is just getting completely obliterated and everything just dies. That's not, that's not for me. And I understand that there's people who love that stuff. Good on you, dude. I hope you continue to enjoy all that stuff, but that's not for me. I appreciate the slower pace, the more methodical play style. I like that stuff. And that is definitely one of the vibes that I got from that. I found the gameplay to be very satisfying in terms of like using the different abilities. Like I mentioned earlier during the visuals, the impact of the abilities felt really good. It was a lot of fun. I played uh, all the time that I've played in the beta. I've been playing in World Tier Two. These are there's two difficulties that you can play on, and there's um, there's some stuff to to go over there, which I thought thought was interesting. So initially, I played with a barbarian, and the barbarian felt way more challenging than the other two classes. So at the start, I was like, "Oh wow, the game is really hard. This is really cool. This is more challenging. I love this. This is fantastic." And then I played the other classes and I just like literally ripped through everything. And I was like, oh, so the game actually isn't harder. The Barbarian is just way weaker than the other classes at the beginning of the game. And you know, you can make the argument, yeah, but maybe later it will be more powerful. Balance at the start doesn't really matter, blah, 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 blah. And it's like, whatever. I'm not here to talk too much about balancing when it comes to a beta. One of the things that I would like to point out is that a lot of people were making the claim that like, oh, they need to need to buff Barbarian. Barbarian needs to be buffed to kind of be brought in line with the other two classes. And my thought process was exactly the opposite because I had way more fun playing the weaker Barbarian than I did playing the Sorceress or the Rogue because it was pretty mindless playing the Sorceress or the Rogue because I was just destroying everything. I barely had to even think about which build I was using. Everything was just getting completely melted. As a matter of fact, earlier today, I was literally spamming firewalls, which is potentially not... I don't think that for this beta, that is the preferred play style, and I was still able to just completely melt bosses without any problem. Hell, I almost killed the Butcher with that build, because Butcher spawned on me, and, and I was like, really, bro? You're going to spawn on me on my Sorceress when I'm trying out Firewall? Gee, thanks! And I still almost killed him, 
But yeah, trying to kill the butcher who's constantly rushing you with firewalls. Yeah, that that's not that's probably not gonna happen. It's like a, a millimeter left though, dude. It was a millimeter left. Almost got his ass. But you know, the 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 point here is playing the barbarian when it was the weakest class was much more fun because it required me to be much more aware of what build I was doing, of what uh, type of attacks I should be avoiding. You know, when I was actually fighting the bosses, it felt like an actual boss fight, which is something that you don't always necessarily get with the RPGs, usually with boss fights and a lot of the RPGs. What you get is like, okay, this mob has a little bit more health than the other ones, and I gotta be careful with one or two attacks, but mostly I'm just gonna go in there and mash buttons and nuke him down. And in here, felt like I actually had to pay attention, really gotta step out of these things, gotta make sure that I respect these mechanics, and so on and so forth, and that was really satisfying. As a matter of fact, I had a blast whenever I would find a boss that would, you know, take me longer to kill because I would actually go back and I would respec my, my build and I'd be like, oh, let's try out this different ability for this boss. Like, one of the bosses that I struggled with a lot was when a dungeon and there was a wolf there called the Den Mother and she would just murder my barbarian. Like, absolutely murder it. And so I came up with the strategy where I would have a bleed generator and a bleed spender and basically, I, just, I would just like hit her twice with the bleeds and dip out and then go in and basically did this hit and run thing and it worked. I killed it. So I, I thought that was really cool because I was like, oh, man, I'm thinking about this and I'm adjusting my build and I'm, you know, to go ahead and face against this boss and stuff is working. This is great. Now, by the by the end, the end point of my barbarian, I was using very different skills. I was using like uh, the charge skill because there's a lot of mobs that run away from you. And I was like, no, nah, I'm just going to keep charging and generating and then upheaval because you can get a thing with upheaval where it like stacks uh the more you use other skills it starts stacking the damage up to like plus 80 percent damage and then you're just like pfft, one big cone that just destroys and deletes everything it was really fun my barbarian was also start to be loaded with legendaries and stuff like that so in case people are wondering well you didn't have that much gear on your barbarian so maybe that's why you had a hard time now my barbarian was stacked with legendaries by the time i was done and it still feels like the other two classes were more powerful. But I think that, again, I, I don't know what Blizzard is going to go for. I don't know what the player base is thinking. And this is actually something that I'm curious. If you happen to have played the beta, then let me know how you feel about that. But I think that the experience that I had with the Barbarian would be the preferred experience. Where things are more challenging versus you just deleting everything. Because you can just delete everything with the, with the Sorceress and the Rogue. And it's... Barely anything can kill you apart maybe the world boss, right? So what I'm thinking is they need to nerf the other two classes and bring them in level of the Barbarian so that everybody experiences a certain level of challenge. I think that's way more interesting, but maybe that's just me and I'd be curious to hear from you guys how you feel about that. Um, the other thing was I was talking about respects just now and according to one of the interviews that I saw earlier... The intention of the developers is that they don't want you respecking willy-nilly. They want to allow you to respec, but they want the game to get to a point where respecking becomes prohibitively expensive. And they, they want to be like, oh, well, you have your whirlwind barbarian, and then you have like your upheaval barbarian or something like that. And I fundamentally disagree with that approach of the game. I think it doesn't make any sense at all. I think that respecking was so much fun. Like on my very first day alone, I respec my character like five or six times. I don't think it makes any sense that they want respecking to eventually become prohibitively expensive. And I know that I've seen on an Asmongold video where we were saying, oh man, but the cost of respecking was super cheap. It's like, yeah, on the very early levels, as you get to like level 25, respecting your character is upwards of like 5,000 gold or however much it was. And it seems to be scaling almost exponentially. So by the time you get to like level 40, it's probably going to be something like 100 or 200k or something like that. By the time you get to 100, I don't even want to think about it. It's going to be completely prohibitively expensive. And I don't think that makes any sense. I think that respecking should be a core part of the experience for multiple reasons. Number one, the first reason is what I experienced, which was, hey, there's this boss struggling with it i'm going to change my build specifically to tailor this boss and i'm going to go kill this boss with this modified build and it was a fantastic time i enjoyed the crap out of it if i wasn't able to respect to experiment with different skills i would have been pretty pissed off but besides that there's an even greater point to this imagine for instance that you are someone who is balls deep into whirlwind 
right? You are a whirlwind barbarian through and through. You put all of your points into whirlwind and all of your synergy skills that could possibly synergize off of whirlwind. You put all your points in that and you're just like, you're running through the world. Boom, big legendary drop. Not a legendary, let's say even a unique, which is going to be the next tier of legendaries that you're going to be getting in endgame and stuff like that. Unique weapon drops. and like, holy crap, a unique weapon. Let's go. You pick up the weapon and it's got like some kind of weird ass modifier that's going to make upheaval completely busted. And you're looking at your whirlwind barbarian going like, yeah, yeah. That fucking sucks. You see what I mean? I think that respecking should just be... I don't even... I'm not even saying that there shouldn't be like a gold cost associated with it. If you want to have a gold cost, sure. I just don't want that gold cost to ever reach the point where it is prohibitively expensive. It should be at the, at the maximum like a minor deterrent. But it should not... Never, ever reach the point, as the developer said, prohibitively expensive. I don't, I don't think that makes any sense whatsoever as a matter of fact i think that respecking should just straight up be free why because it's fun because it's fun that's why i don't need any other reasons because it's fun that's it but um yeah that was my experience when it came to the diablo 4 beta like i said there's plenty of gameplay on the channel if you guys want to check that out um uh next weekend I'm going to be streaming this again because they're going to allow people to play the Necromancer and the Druid. In this beta, you can only play uh, Barbarian and Sorceress and Rogue. Sorceress and Rogue are two classes that I'm not interested in, but in, interested in at all. So the class that I'm actually interested in is Barbarian, Necro, and Druid, strangely enough. So Necro and Druid are coming next week. I'm going to be streaming at least on Friday. Uh, I'm going to be streaming that, and I'm going to be checking out the Necro, seeing all of that good stuff. Hopefully, I'll see you guys there for that beta, and hopefully, you guys will have a chance to check it out for yourselves. Because you guys are curious what the game run like on the PS5. It ran fine, ran 60 FPS throughout most of the experience. Didn't really experience any major glitches, like we had two disconnects for the whole beta period. First disconnect put me in a queue for 56 minutes. Second disconnect put me in a queue for 48 minutes, I think. And I, you know, once I reconnected, it just worked again, no problems. I ran into some rubber banding with my sorceress on the, was it the second day? No, on the third day. On the third day, I had rubber banding issues with the sorceress. But I didn't really have almost any rubber banding at all before the third day when I was playing the sorceress, which was weird. But, uh... Yeah, overall, the game ran fine. People were asking me, the, how does it play on a controller? Like I said, I've played it on a controller before. It's really good. I prefer playing it on the controller versus playing with mouse and keyboard. It feels better to me personally, to each their own. Um, and um, yeah, not not no major bug. Th there was a, a graphical bug that occurred after one of the cutscenes where everything became kind of like grainy and sparkly which is like almost like a weird weird filter was applied. But uh, once I got that bug for the second time, I just tried uh, not really logging out, but going up to the character selection screen and logging back in. And that solved that instantly. So I'm sure that that's something that they can fix relatively easily. I don't see how that's going to be a major problem. But other than that, I don't really see a whole lot of issues. Uh, in terms of the world boss, which was like uh, a raid encounter that you had, there was this world boss looked like a giant hydralisk. I'm probably going to be uploading that fight separately here on the channel for those of you who are curious. They even zoom out the camera because the boss is so big that if the, the camera was zoomed in, you wouldn't be able to see everything that is happening around you. It was uh, an interesting fight. It was pretty much one shot city. So the moment you miss one mechanic, you are most likely going to die. So I don't know if hardcore players are going to be having a whole lot of fun when it comes to... When it comes to world bosses and by hardcore players, there's a toggle that you can do on your character where you can mark certain characters as hardcore. And what that means is when they die, they're gone. They, they're, they're actually dead. They don't come back. Um, but overall, I thought that the world boss was enjoyable the first time we failed um, because there was a timer on it. I'm not sure if that timer is intended, if they're going to have that uh for the final version of the game it was kind of annoying because we were pretty close to killing it and then the boss was just like peace out bitches i'm out and you just left and i was like what do you mean so you just like you came up you beat the crap out of a bunch of people and then you left that's kind of weird 
So I, I, I don't know how I feel about that aspect of it. But then again, if they don't put a time limit on it, you would just be able to murder it eventually through attrition. You'd be dying and step back up and dying and step back up. Although, there is a limit, because every time that you die, you lose like 10% your ability of gear. So, you know, the main mechanic of the boss was he had like these swiping attacks, which basically worked like a donut attack in uh, Final Fantasy XIV. What that means is it's safer inside the boss's hitbox. And um, there's like a medium range around the boss that is going to get hit by these arc attacks. So that's something that you would have to dodge. Then there were these um, front front attacks that he would do and then he would slash back uh, with his claws. Those were actually really cool because you would think, oh, I have to get out of the boss's hitbox in order to dodge it and you could do that. But there's actually a, a safe spot right in the middle, right between the boss's arms as he does the slashing thing which allowed you to, re to keep up time and attack the boss. So I thought that that was cool. Mechanically, the boss felt pretty satisfying to do. Um, but yeah, there's not much else to say when it comes to the the raid boss. It was it was a pretty fun fight, not overly complicated. And once you've seen the different mechanics, it becomes fairly easy to, to manage and to, to tackle. Hopefully some of the other boss fights will be a little bit more complicated and stuff like that. Uh, in terms of drops, though, I feel like they probably amped up the drops so that people could experiment with legendaries and stuff like that. I've seen some complaints about the itemization um, from players that tend to play a lot more ARPGs than I do. Uh, and I, I can understand because, like, some of the items felt fairly simple. But I'm like, well, this is still, like, low-level stuff. I want to see what the unique items are like before I actually talk about itemization and stuff like that. You're able to remove the affixes of legendaries and slap them onto rare items, which then makes those items legendaries. So I thought that that was interesting. So basically, you picking up a legendary early on in the game doesn't necessarily mean that it's a complete waste because you can actually extract the important part of that legendary and place it on another item later on. So that is kind of a cool thing because usually in... Diablo games, whenever you pick up a legendary at like level 10, you're like, well, crap. There goes my luck, right? Whereas this time, you're, you're going to be like, well, I'll just extract the thing from this and put in another item later on uh, when uh, I find a more powerful item, which is cool. So I like that aspect of it. Um, but yeah. Now, I wanted to dive a little bit more into the story. So if you are concerned about spoilers or anything, I'm just going to be talking about this act one stuff that we experienced because like I said at the start of this, the story was one of the things that was very impressive for me. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about that. So if you're done with, uh, if you got all the information that you wanted, please hit the like button, subscribe, all notification, icon, all that jazz. Otherwise in three, two, one, spoilers are coming in for those of you that haven't watched anything of the game. So you start things off and you're you're in this uh, this ice location, like whatever the the it's frost peaks something whatever. I I forget what the name of the location is. My memory is complete garbage. But you start it off, and you're like in a cave, and there's like this wolf that comes up to you, and supposedly the wolf protects you or something like that to um, keep you from getting attacked. But at the very beginning of the game, you're going off, and you get into this town. You get into this town. There's a couple of people arguing that there's like a a crazy monk or whatever who's been infected and whatnot, and they're trying to, like, figure out what to do with him. And so you talk with them, and they tell you, oh, there's, like, some evil influences over in this cave over there, and you go to this cave, and you kill the monsters, and you actually find the, um... You find the... Um, what, what is he, like, a some kind of a priest that shows up at the starting cinematic of the game? And you fight some boss, and then you come back to the town. And then when you come back to the town, this is actually a really neat thing, which is they're like, hey, we can't really pay much, but hey, we got stew and we got beer. We're going to feed you and everybody starts partying and your character's like eating and drinking. And suddenly they drug your character. And I was like, oh, interesting. Then they take your character out back to a shed where it seems like they're about to butcher you. And they put some blood petals from Lilith into your mouth and force you to like swallow them which then gives you like the ability to see flashbacks of places where Lilith has been, which is kind of cool. And then you basically butcher the whole town. The, the, the monk shows up and he kind of like wakes you up and you butcher the whole town because they're all crazy. They've all been kind of like corrupted by Lilith. And I thought that was cool because there's 
more cinematic moments to it than what I would expect in a Diablo game. And it felt good. I understand that for a lot of people, they come to Diablo game, they want to party up with the boys and like, hey, let's just slay demons and stuff. And there's plenty of that. But there are also these story moments that are going to like slow things down if you're partying it up with the boys. And I get it that for a lot of people, that's going to be a problem. But for me, I kind of appreciated the extra attention to detail when it comes to the storytelling. Because, you know, like I said, Diablo 3 was very much party up with the boys who cares about what's happening in the story. In Diablo 4, the approach is the exact opposite. It's like, no, this story is important and we're going to tell this story. And so they will straight up be like, hey, here's a cutscene. You can skip the cutscene if you don't want to watch it. If you're the type of guy that just wants to like kill monsters, you can do that. You can skip all the cutscenes, skip all the dialogue. Boom, boom, boom. Don't even have to worry about it. But for me... Someone that really likes the world of Sanctuary and appreciates, you know, the, the Diablo elements of the lore and all of that, I thought that was really cool. As a matter of fact, you might be wondering, oh, do I have to play the other Diablos to really understand the story here? And they give you a lot of the background throughout the first act about s some of the events that already took place in the world of Sanctuary. They don't give you everything, like there are things that you're going to be missing out on, but... They give you most of it, like, enough where if you're asking me, oh, is it safe to start on Diablo 4, I'd be like... Yeah, I mean, you should probably play Diablo 2 because it's a freaking amazing game, at least. But, you know, you can start on Diablo 4 if that's what you want, and the story will still give you tidbits of stuff that happened in the world before. So there's that. Then there's the cutscene of, of Lilith at the church where they show you how Lilith corrupted this town. She just kind of, like, shows up and kind of seduces the, the villagers into temptation. And it's really cool because they just beat the crap out of this priest who's like, resist, resist or tempted. And you see like the psycho faces in the villagers, the, 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 the psycho expressions in the villagers faces and just like, Jesus Christ, that is wild. It's really well done. I was very impressed. Like I said, like they did a fantastic job when it comes to that stuff. Um, and yeah, then there's, there's some more stuff like you, you get to, to see, um, Lilith, you get to see Inarius, you get to see the, the, the corpse of Rathma and Lilith, like grabbing the key to hell for whatever she's going to be doing with that. And there's just like some really cool, there, yeah, there, there's this other, there's this dude in the story who's like this guard, right? And he lets, uh, the, this child's mother pass. He lets her pass through, uh, onto a mine and she goes into the mine with Lilith. Because the, in, in deeper into that mine is where you find, like, the, the corpse of, of Rathma. And so this, basically, the, the child's mother bribed him with, like, a bracelet or something. So this kind of, like, paints this, this, um, this knight as a very corrupt person. And as you are navigating through this mine, the knight is with you and the child is with you. And you can tell that, like, oh, this guy's kind of, like, a corrupt person. But then they actually have, like, a story arc around him. And, you know, he kind of tells you like, yeah, I, I have my vices and I have my problems. I want to be a better man and all of these things where it kind of like shows that he's got some regret and stuff like that. Like really developing the character of this student. Then later into the game, you're fighting like a, a random boss when you're deep into the mine. And the, the knight's supposedly already left. He's someplace else doing something different. You're fighting this boss, and a big suit of armor shows up, almost like a friggin' Warhammer Dreadnought shows up and kind of, like, helps you fighting this boss. He makes a shield for you, does all of these things. But then, when you defeat the boss, this, this knight's armor just kind of, like, falls to the ground, falls to one knee, he's all busted up, and your character starts opening up the armor. And inside the armor is the guy, the, the knight, who was, like, repenting. And the, the inside of this armor is like an Iron Man. It's got spikes all over it. It's like powered through the face, faith of the person operating it or something. I've never seen something like that um, before, personally. And I saw that stuff and I was like, damn, that was badass. And then he, he basically dies. It's just like, I thought that was a really cool character arc for this character that you kind of like, you see and you think... Oh, this is like going to be a one-sided character, corrupt idiot, whatever. When I first saw him, I actually thought that he was just going to die. Like in some either moment of trying to save his own skin or something like that. I thought that was that was the read that I had on that character. I was like, oh, this guy, he's going to die. He's going to die when he get down there. He's going to like try to get away. going to try to do something. He's going to die. But 
I did not see it coming that they were going to have a whole redemption arc for him where he was going to die, but he was going to die helping you. And, you know, I'm a bit of a sucker when it comes to martyrdom and stuff like that. So maybe that's just kind of like was cooler for me than it's going to be for most people. But I appreciate the attention to detail to the stuff that they did with the story. Now, having said all that, there still is obviously the problem of the business model. You know, the experience was fantastic, all of that jazz, but the business model of this game is still something that I think is completely atrocious. Mon like the game for starters, where I live, I think this is like $100 for the digital, digital deluxe edition. And the digital deluxe edition is the one that gives you a four day head start over the other players. Now, you guys already know I don't like that. Uh, as a content creator, I have to do it because to give you guys an idea, those of you who are watching the stream, like actually you can just see it for yourself. Go back to the channel, go to the live section of this channel and see the number of views that I got for beta day one versus beta day two and beta day three. That's how important it is for a content creator to get access on a game day one. Unless you're a huge content creator, which fortunately that's, that's not me. I'm like a average sized content creator, so I still have to hustle so to me that's what i'm gonna do i'm gonna have to get the digital deluxe edition uh to be able to play it early so that i can stream it create content do all of that stuff but if i wasn't creating content for starters i probably would wait for a discount but if you absolutely have to play it i would recommend you know do the standard version or whatever because like i would not recommend doing the digital deluxe edition because i don't like that business practice i think it's complete trash i also don't like the the season pass stuff that they're doing i think it's absolutely disgusting uh and yeah particularly when it comes to the price of the game and then on top of it including a season pass and a premium season battle pass tier and a, and a advanced battle pass thing and it's like bro why do you need all these things jesus christ but anyways, uh, this is already way longer than I intended to. These are my thoughts on the Diablo 4 beta. If you guys enjoyed this video, hit it up with a like. If you did not enjoy this video, hit up with a dislike. Feedback is important. I'll see you guys in the next one. Stay strong. Stay safe. Peace out.